Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My name is Sotil, and I'm joined by Derek, the perfect gentleman brown, alongside me. And we have a bit of a treat for you, two practice partners, two friends who have achieved their goal of qualifying for the World Championship, making it to the top four in this tournament, and now get to face off against each other. That's exactly right. These are some of my favorite matches that we get to see in Hearthstone, where it reminds you, even when you are best friends, practice partners in the tavern, you put all of that aside, and it's just a good, friendly match of Hearthstone, but there's still a tremendous amount on the line while they have both managed to qualify for the World Championships. Points and prize money will make all the difference here for both of these players. Oh, let's meet the players. Our first semi-final competitor for this matchup. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Bunny Hopper. The only undefeated player left. Can Bunny Hopper continue his streak all the way? And his opponent, again, a good friend and a practice partner, but now a rival, it's Viper! After a great run through the champs, could Viper have met his match in an identical lineup? And that is the question. 120 cards versus 120 cards. And although these uh, players now find themselves with the same lineups and in the same spot, the spot they wanted to be, they had very, very different paths to get here. So let's check out how exactly they achieved their goal setting out for this tournament to qualify for the World Championship, starting with Bunny Hopper, who, as Derek mentioned, is the only remaining undefeated player in the tournament, uh, picking off glory in that opening round. And then he was threatening to shatter the dreams of Killing All Day, put an end to hashtag Yokad for good, but Killing All Day was able to come out of that bracket in the loser's spot. And then in the quarterfinal game, as we saw just very recently, he was able to defeat Turner three games to two, overcoming that aggressive lineup to find himself now against Viper. That's all right, Bunny Hopper and Viper both showing the real strength, I believe, of this lineup in just its diversity. It's managing to take out the aggressive lineups in Killin' All Day and Turner, and also some of the slower lineups like we saw against Glory. It really is just, as these two players have highlighted, I think the three best decks you can bring to a conquest. Yeah, Viper, on the other hand, slightly more tumultuous route to get to the same point as his uh, cohort picking up the win early on against Race, but then losing that 0-3 to Xiao Ti. Xiao Ti, my pick for the whole tournament, still feel he had the best lineup, but just ran into a couple of unfortunate positions and a few misplays on his own part. But Viper then went marching through, picking up the win against Hansoku, and then the epic against Nao Gudan in the quarterfinals. <sighs> Still, I'm still recovering from that series. I don't want to think about it. Let's move on to what we have at hand here, and that's the matchup between these two players. And we were worried, Derek, coming into this. We're about to take a look at their lineups, and we weren't really going to have a lot to talk about because they're mirrored lineups, yeah. 120 versus 120. The question is like, who's favored? Where are the breakpoints? All become very strange. But something a little bit unusual has happened. I think these two players may have basically just tried to get in each other's heads Arguably a little, a little bit too much as we do have different bands from both of these players. And we were having a little bit of a talk before the match as do we feel who came out on top in this scenario, who predicted a scenario which didn't come to fruition. And I'm still just not entirely sure if I can decide. I mean, the Shutterwalk Shaman being banned away has to be good. You're playing an almost full control lineup. Right. But then getting rid of the control mage, you had your own Shutterwalk Shaman banned, which is a really good match up for you and you still have your rogue so it gets very confusing very quickly yeah but just at the the very root of it it's just bizarre to see them banning away different decks when you come in with a with a mirrored lineup yeah. definitely some some mind games going in there trying to one-up each other but at that point you're still basing it on the fact that the other person is going to potentially play mind games with you as opposed to banning the best deck it's Definitely a little bit hard to unpick, but what we do know is that our opening game is going to be Rogue up against the Even Warlock, and this has kind of almost been Killing All Day's trademark. This is how he's been progressing right. through the tournament. He's been getting his Even Warlock through against Rogue, where he's really not supposed to. It's an unfavored match for him. And in fact, a big part of the reason why it fell apart at the top four stage is that he wasn't able to do that in the end strength. up against AA, who did pick up that uh, Leroy to go with his perfectly preserved shadow. <laughs> Shadow step in his hand. It was indeed, as Sotil is alluding to, uh, in the casting green room at least, we were yeah, questioning out. of his plays there. But, I mean, if you were going to take a matchup with Evenlock against a Miracle Rogue player, I think Viper is 
probably the last person in the world you would choose to go up against. Miracle Rogue, for a long time, has just been one of his signature decks. He is the guy to play this. A slight addendum, mayhaps, as a complex player. Second last, I've got to rep my boy. Okay. The last person I want to play against as a Miracle Rogue is Casey. Right. But Viper will be a close second. And Viper, I mean, several times has highlighted that Casey was a practice partner for him and Bunny Hopper. Yep. So I'm sure some of that signature wisdom will have rubbed off on him. Choosing to uh, curve out a little bit more aggressively than you might be used to seeing with even lock, just kind of regarded as this uh, this double tap opening into a big threat on turn three or turn four, depending on whether you have the liberty of the coin. But yeah, the one of the big things about bad matchups is that your normal curve just doesn't yeah. really work against mm. a bad matchup. You have to do something just a little bit different, and Bunny Hopper is choosing to do so, just curving out a little bit more aggressively with that vulgar uh, homunculus. That's exactly right. With the Mountain Giant on turn four, you're vulnerable to Sap, Volspine Slayer, or them just ignoring it a lot of the time. Whereas yeah. if they get a Hench Clan Thug uncontested on turn three and then follow up with a whole bunch of damage, the Mountain Giant just doesn't do anything. You're simply dead before you can respond. Not the greatest looking hand right now for Viper. He does have Valdori Strider, he does have Valspine available, but he's whiffed on the early minions, the Cold Blood targets, the Hench Clan Thugs, the Edwins, the Questing Adventurers, things that you can really develop early and punish Bunny Hopper for playing this slightly slow deck with some limited early game. But, you know, it's there's no great uh, explosive turns coming out from Bunny Hopper just yet, especially with the route that he's taken, of course. Quite through necessity of just playing out some early minions and not just light tapping through to that giant. And I think while it's not always the way that Rogue would like things to go, in this matchup, as the game progresses in an even state where neither player is pulled particularly far ahead, I don't think that works too well for the Rogue in this scenario. You generally want to pull ahead as quickly as you can with either uh, Firefly, like Cold Blood, Edwin, or the majority of cases, Hench Clan Thug, because as you get into the later stages of the game, you don't really have the option in Rogue of leaving their health total super oh, high so they can't activate Hook to Reavers. I think generally you need to get that damage in consistently so you can finish things off with a Sap or a Valspine Slayer. So as the game does progress, the Warlock should be able to get a pretty strong foothold onto the board unless Viper can start to make some pretty spicy plays. Yep. And while we have this matchup around the turn so three, turn four mark, I do want to refer back. There's there's kind of a little amusing anecdote going on where uh, you may have seen the clip uh, featuring everyone's favorite HCT analyst, Gamer Sensei, <laughs> Sensei's Rosti, uh, who broke down one of Viper's turns. And then uh, there was some discussion on Twitter. RDU called out that maybe Rosti was wrong and that the, the original play that he was suggesting was wrong, might have been right the whole time. And then Viper showed up, went, no, RDU, you're wrong, but Rosti was wrong as well. There's an even better play than either <laughs> of you suggested. Um, and kind of set them both straight. So it just goes to show, you know, even in matchups where you're favored, that the levels of complexity that still exist in what a lot of people think is on the surface a very simple so card game. Yeah. Like it just isn't. There's so many layers um, to playing Hearthstone and, you know, squeezing out every last possible point of percentage. Bunny Hopper starting to be faced with what is. A pretty simple turn in the immediate, but needs to start taking this time to map out what his overall game plan is here in all scenarios. What is he saving Spellbreaker for? There's obviously not too much you're using it for against the Rogue, so will he just start throwing them down once he's run out of other threats? Does that get played before a Hooked Reaver can't get its full value either? So much to consider in about how you meter out your threats, because clearly with a hand full of minions for Bunny Hopper, he has to be developing his own win condition here, pressuring his own board control because he doesn't have any reactive answers at all at the moment. Bunny Hopper, I mean, it looks like a fairly straightforward Mountain Giant turn on the surface, but when you start to dig down into it, is it really the best option? You just saw a Valspine Slayer, but there's still plenty of ways available for that Giant to get punished. Yeah. Um, you know, the least of which would be that kind of cold blood tempo play that that, that rusty breakdown was really all about in the long run. But there are much scarier options than that still in, in things like Sap blowing you out completely. And again, as I mentioned, with Mountain Giant, with the possibility of coming down on turn four, 
If Bunny Hopper had done that, Viper, I think, could have quite happily just on Faldoroy Strider into Cold Blood, push everything through to face, and just demand an answer from Bunny Hopper. And single Mountain Giant is not clearing off enough stuff, which my Bunny Hopper here, I think, is being led to the play of trying to clear the board completely, seize bash back initiative, then follow up with the Mountain Giant when he's not taking any damage in the meanwhile. Hmm. It's a great option because you see Viper's hand is just packed full of options for punishing that Mountain Giant play yeah. if it did come down. You, you know, there's so many levels of in that you could go here if the Mountain Giant came down. You could just sap Cold Blood and go in. Yeah. You could Faldori Strider prep sap. You could just fan and sap. Or you could do all of the above. <laughs> Faldori Strider prep sap Cold Blood the yeah. Vile Spine Slayer. Essentially, Bunny Hopper would have been in a huge mess if he'd have just made the rather obvious looking play of playing Mountain Giant on that turn. Now on the oh, other side for Viper, too. things get a lot more difficult and the rope is burning already as it seems like he only just started thinking about his turn. Does he want to use one of his precious saps now before he's even seeing something like a, a hooked reaver or a giant at all? And he's going for the play that you pointed out last turn that he could have done on the giant yep. just to make a nice big board and demand an answer from his opponent. And in terms of answers that he could even deliver, Outside of Hellfire into Defile, exactly. It feels like there's very little that can be done here. Yeah, the big difference here is that the Doomsayer healed Bunny Hopper for seven over the Mountain Giant play. Yep. Bunny Hopper still has a Mountain Giant in hand, which he can start to use to consolidate pressure if he gets a grip back on the board. The board state that he's facing down is exactly the same as the punish he would have received from the Mountain Giant, but he does have that crucial seven extra health to yep. play with. But so many coming, like, looking at it even closer, like is that even to his benefit? You know, being out of range of those hooked reavers here, would he rather even be at 12 than 19? Uh, I think with the way his hand is currently shaping up, every single point of life is just too precious to be considering about hooked reavers right now. Okay. A Volga Homunculus and a Sun Fury Protector in hand. He's got a good amount of taunt outside of the hooked reaver, and he knows with aggressive plays like this from Viper, the chances of him having a Leroy or another Sap or another Vile Spine in hand to push through for the extra damage is surprisingly high. Just gonna taunt up this Mountain Giant and he's using a Taunt Activator, yeah. which makes Viper's Sap or Vile Spine even more powerful here, but not much choice. He really doesn't want to be taking 11 in this position. And here for Viper, again, a seemingly innocuous turn on its surface with, I mean, what I'm looking at as Shiv face, sap the giant and push everything else to the face as well to try and close out the game. Mm. Kind of becomes a lot more confusing then because are you afraid of Hooked Reaver in that scenario? A little bit. Do you want to trade off a minion here so that you can save that sap? I think in this instance though, it's as you were pointing out in the last series, you don't want to overthink yourself. You could come up with a multitude of different reasons to save this sap, right. but getting forward, what, 12 damage to the face on this turn cannot be bad. Yeah, I think with the way the board state's broken down, this is just fine. You'd be scared if, say, something like Defile Hooked Reaver here on seven mana was a possibility right. for the opponent. That would be an issue for you, but it, it just isn't. The breakpoints just don't exist. Yeah. Uh, so the full push here just seems very, very fitting. And it does seem these players, you know, with the World Championship achieved already, are playing a little bit more relaxed and a little bit quicker. You know, these players have been involved in the two longest series yep. of the tournament so far. Uh, Bunny Hopper with a one hour 58 series very early on, and then that Viper Now Gridan epic that we just watched coming in just under that at one hour 54. Would you like to hazard a so guess as to who got to cast both of those series? Uh, Go on, give it to me. It was us. Was it us? It was us. Wow. I think I remember that all, what was it, five years ago as Viper takes the favorable series, the Miracle Rogue, doing what it always seems to do for Viper in particular, bringing himself 1-0 up against the identical lineup in Bunny. Yeah, now with that Rogue victory on the board, um, Bunny's Shaman being banned is starting to become a, a little less of a factor because, you know, that was that was the matchup you wanted to line your Rogue up into in particular. Right. The Rogue was going to get a win wherever it was along the line. You know, we could, like, dissect these bans until the end of time. It is just a very strange situation. But, yeah, I mean, that's the matchup that I was very...
very worried about with the aggressive lineups that we saw in the tournament in general. Okay. Tur Turner's lineup and uh, Killing All Day's lineup both had that even lock packed in there, yeah. but they were primarily you know, targeting rogues with their other very aggressive decks. So having that weakness there with their even lock against those rogue lineups, I think was always going to be a liability. And you're starting to see in other matchups now how powerful rogue is in that matchup. That's exactly right. I think maybe the thing that offset that for Viper in particular, because while we have disagreed with some of his plays in sp with specific decks, the even lock in particular, I think we really liked his creative play style with it. And even from Bunny Hopper there as well, not going with the traditional lines of tap, tap every single turn, realizing what the actual good stuff in each matchup is. Very good matchup understanding with that even lock. So still, I think it's, Bunny's got a good chance of taking the win with it. I couldn't agree more, but until we find out if that is the case, just give the players a quick moment to regroup their thoughts. We'll be right back after this. Thanks for cheering me on. <laughs> uh, I don't know, what do people usually say during this? I'm Bonnie Hopper. I'm from Germany and I currently live in Oslo, Norway. I, I like playing Hearthstone firstly because uh, I've loved playing games since I was a child. It really appealed to me that you can build your deck, you can make your strategy, and then on the other hand, I'm also just a competitive person. I, I don't know if I approach the tournaments and lineup building and things like this scientifically, but I definitely love to just write down all my ideas and usually when I prepare lineups for tournaments I'll take out a college block and I'll just write several pages with lineups and tech cards and just random arrows on what is good against what. In terms of preparation for this tournament I prepared again with Casey and Viper and we've been a training group for over a year now and we prepared closely together. And it's been quite successful with uh, all of us having good scores and Casey making top 16 twice. We have forgotten what makes us strong. Some people just go by, okay, it's a mathematical problem. There's always one answer that's the right answer, the right call, the right decks. But figuring it out is not easy. And I'm probably one of the guys that wants to do something different, not just go with everyone expects, try to counter, try to beat what people bring. Viper takes it three to two. A lot of people made like those statistics um, about who's gonna make it out of groups, who's gonna win and so on and they just took HSV play stats and decks and whatsoever, but playing control decks like Mage, Shadowbox Shaman and so on, if you play them well and you face the matchups you want to face, they are like way better compared to the statistics you're just gonna get by looking at ladder. I cannot bring the same stuff as everyone else and then expect to win. I have to do something different to overcome them. hearing to both of those players talk, uh, particularly Bunny Hopper, I think one of the smartest, one of the most underrated players in Hearthstone. And, you know, he is an incredible intellect. He's uh, a published author already in a journal of physical chemistry. He's studying for his PhD right now. The title of his PhD thesis, I can't remember it, but it like, I'm pretty sure it contains more words Do than remember. just admirable nose in total. <laughs> 
it's it's absurd. I, I wouldn't even try and read it back for you. It was it was used as like a bit on Trinity series at one point where someone yeah. had to guess the name of his paper. Ridiculous sounding thing. I don't even know what on earth Bunny Hop is studies or writes about. I just know that he's way smarter than I am. I think it was how stuff works. <laughs> sure, yeah, let's go with that. Something along those lines. We're here, another matchup that's been one of the cornerstones of the Hearthstone Championship Tour. Summer Championship with two very highly represented decks. Shadowwalk Shaman up against Even Warlock. And while Shadowwalk Shaman has led to some of the most crazy games we've seen so far this weekend, with a hand like this, double mana tied to get things going, it looks like Viper might be off to a pretty nice lead to take this game. Yeah, and we've had some uh, some uh, controversy in the Caster Green Room on this matchup as well. I feel this is slightly favored for Shadow Walk Shaman from, from my perspective. I think at the very, very highest level with optimal play from you know, the best even Warlock player in the world versus the best Shadow Walk Shaman player in the world, it ends up being Shadow Walk favored. Um, Cora borderline threatened to fight me over this issue. She insists that even Warlock just beats you up too quickly. But do you have an opinion? Do you want to do you want to take a side on this argument? I first of all have some advice. Mm -hmm. Do not take her up on that fight. Agreed. You will lose. It is a lose lose situation for me, regardless. But mostly just lose. She exactly. Probably beat. Me. But uh, I would have to agree with you in this scenario. At the very least, with the lineup of Shadowwalk Shaman that is played by Viper and Bunny Hopper with two copies of Earthshock knocking about in there, as well as a Black Knight, which really helps to swing things back in your favor after you've played the Shadowwalk. Obviously, two Earthshocks to deal with the Twilight Drakes, and then obviously Hexes or Volcanoes to deal with the Giants. Generally, I feel like the even Warlock struggles to put on enough pressure before the Shadowwalk Shaman can either stall out the game to their Shadowwalk or just remove all the threats. Yeah, I think also on top of that, the, the crucial and probably the most telling tech inclusion in both Bunny Hopper and Viper's list so in this tournament, the one copy of Life Drinker as well. They really explained that it was in particular beneficial for this matchup because mm. you don't want to be playing cards that deal three damage to your opponent's face when you know the, the even Warlock has cards in their deck that just does that to themselves. That's right. part of their game plan. They want to lower their health below 15. Mana Tide, go. Pretty straightforward. Ooze in hand for Bunny Hopper, um, but the Taunt Totem was rolled crucially for Viper on the earlier turn anyway, which really shut some of this madness down. Um, sometimes there are matchups where you can debate whether pressing Totem or not is correct, but the opportunity to guard a Mana Tide behind this, uh, this Taunt Totem is a huge win. And having seen that Taunt Totem, uh, Brian Kibler and I have both been heavily advocating for playing Acidic Swampoos on two in this matchup. But with the Taunt Totem there, there's just no point. Yeah, absolutely. And with um, obviously Bunny Hop being on the coin, I think this is a little bit more understandable because he had a giant in hand already. Yep. Wants to get that out on turn three. And he can just follow up with a Hellfire on the following turn if he needs to. If Viper plays out either the Mana Tide or the Acolyte of Pain, it should be a very nice, easy play for Bunny Hopper just to clear up some of that draw and get a good amount of damage going through to the face. That's right. Which makes you wonder if uh, Viper wants to divert away from a second card draw option here when he's already kind of setting up a nice Hellfire board and just, just commit to the Glacial Shard just to lock out right. the Giant. Yep and just move forward from there, make Bunny Hopper drop the Hellfire, just get on with his life, but Viper seems to disagree. He's not even gonna drop the Glacial here. Suggest to me, he's looking for Hex or Volcano, right? He wants to draw two cards here, one off the Mana Tide, and he's happy if he gets Hellfired because he's saying, just freezing this for one turn with a Glacial Shard's not good enough for me. I need to find the permanent answer. It's, I do find it interesting as to why he didn't go with so the Glacial Shard. I was looking at a first glance at uh, being scared of Defile to overdraw you a card on the Acolyte of Pain if you play a one health minion. But even then, Meh. the numbers, exactly, they're not there. And one card being burned to draw three, I think you'd pretty happily take that the majority of the time. And he wouldn't even burn a card because he could dump an extra card from hand with the Glacial Shard. And it would have ended up saving him an extra four, eight health here in this scenario. But Still hey, hexed there in a very timely fashion to help out Viper. Now with the Giant down to five health though, Viper could choose to just try and develop into it and fight it honestly stat for stat. Uh, Glacial Shard, Saranite Chain yeah. Gang is an availability with a Hellfire gone. 
it's a great turn for a Glacial Shard as well because you play around Spellbreaker from the opponent. You know, Spellbreaker to make the giant attack, it still runs into the Taunt Wall. It doesn't connect to your face for that big eight damage. And even while you may be unable to kill it through minions alone, making it a little bit squishier to the Volcano. Potentially, if they develop another Mountain Giant into it, if Bunny Hop is feeling a little bit overzealous, you could then clear up two Giants, or at the very least, two big threats without having played a Hex whatsoever. What's your big fear here? Like, are you scared of Shroom Brewer? Is that enough to really mess with the Volcano maths? It's not, right? It's still reasonable. He trades in, goes down to three, back up to seven, 11 health on the board, 14 with the other Chain Gang. Yeah, he's fine. Viper still, just, just no Glacial Shard, just holding onto it. I wonder if he's trying to set up for Glacial Grumble. Glacial is a, a play Possible. we see more than I would expect with the Shadowwalk Shaman deck. That's definitely something I underrated at first, is how useful both the immediate effect of an another freeze is and how good the secondary effect of having more freeze battle cries in the Shadowwalk pool is. Because then while that does deny him the possibility of guaranteeing an infinite Shudderwalk, so as is always the case against Ethan Warlock, if he just plays one Shudderwalk, summons three six sixes, freezes the entire board, he probably wins anyway from there. He's probably doing all right, yeah. You know. There is the Shroom, Blur, uh, Shroom Brewer play that I was talking about. No life tap here because uh, Bunny Hopper would have taken himself back up to 10 cards, but that is that doesn't actually eliminate that play from happening in right. even Warlock, <laughs> believe it or not, because uh, sometimes the players do consider it such a priority to deal that two life tap damage to themselves that they will happily burn a card in order to do so and get down below 15 I health. Wonder. And with double hook driver in hand, it's a consideration, but not a huge one. I don't know. I think it's a pretty decent consideration. <laughs> right. You've got Giant in hand and a Twilight Drake, and Double Hook three, but the good cards you have left in your deck are like Gul'dan. Lich King. Lich King. I suppose there's a couple good cards in there, but the vast majority of them are very, very weak. And so dealing two extra damage to yourself in the immediate is really good. Hearthstone's weird. <laughs> what happened to my game? Deal two damage to yourself, discard a card. Sick play. <laughs> It's cool, honestly. I like it a lot. It's interesting to see how much the, how adaptive you have to be in your thing. You cannot be relaxed in your Hearthstone study. Now Glacial Shard coming out for just significantly less value than it could have picked up on the previous turns. But he did, in exchange for that, did Viper get much more value out of his Hex because he ate the Mountain Giant. Yes, he could have done that a couple of turns ago, but he picked up the Shroom Brewer Battle Cry off it as well, which you know is is not nothing in the matchup because it's a key uh, tool to won. play around Volcano first and foremost. That's fair. I still think though, at least with the Glacial Shard, having used it on the previous turn, it would have opened up more possibility. Maybe not for Grumble on this turn, but it would have preserved a Saranite Chain Gang on the board. You would have already had the Glacial Shard so in play, ready to go, and he wouldn't have been able to play the Shroom Brewer on the Giant. So he may very well have just had to play the Shroom Brewer on a random minion, sure. just because he doesn't want to get the, the heal to face. I think the big uh, hidden motive behind the Glacial Shard this turn is that he wants to protect that last Chain Gang token. Um, because it's a real yep. power struggle trying to, A, if you're the Shudderwalk player, bounce as many Shudderwalk, um, Chain Gangs back to your hand as you can for your Shudderwalk later on. And then the player that plays against it, trying to make sure that Chain Gangs don't stick to the board. And now with the timing of his Glacial Shard, you can kind of see it all come together, right? The Grumble comes down, he gets a Chain Gang in hand, and he gets to replay Glacial Shard for value yet again. But then he's got to start considering if he's just taking a little bit too much damage if he goes for a Grumble play here, I totally agree that it is, at least in terms of his own game plan, a fantastic time to go for Grumble. Yep. But what does he do after that? Earthshock on the Drake is obviously fantastic. If he silences the Giant, he's then super vulnerable That's very to true. a silence, super which true. he yeah. does have to be very cautious of. So then on this turn, after he's seen a good amount of threats coming down from his opponent, two Giants and a Twilight Drake, he's going into his opponent's turn seven, which is not an especially powerful turn for the Warlock. Maybe he just goes for Earthshock Volcano on this turn to make sure he doesn't take too much damage, because with no healing 
currently in hand could be a little bit too vulnerable to something like a Gul'dan or Hellfire damage. Yep. That does end up being the play, and you might have seen there Viper passing up the opportunity to push the Glacial Shard damage to the face. Again, that's not a mistake. Yep. That is the matchup. You have literally zero need to ever deal any damage to your opponent. Sometimes with the Keleseth deck, I will listen to your argument that you might want to attack occasionally. Yeah. Sometimes. You're still wrong, but I'll listen to you. <laughs> and then call you an idiot. Yes. Right. Uh, with the non keleseth version, you're never winning without you know the Shadowwalk combo going off at the end of the game, or at least a Shadowwalk combo that just puts four six sixes into play that OTKs your opponent from there anyway. So attacking the opponent and activating their hooked reavers is just almost always wrong in the matchup. Yeah. I completely agree with you. It's, it's an interesting dynamic that Shudderwalk has created in the meta where there are still Death Knights in Hearthstone as the most powerful thing that existed in the late game. But now, even with Taunt Druid, with Blood Reaver Gul'dan, nothing beats the late game of Shudderwalk. It simply cannot lose once you get it off and it successfully get a one-mana Shudderwalk back to hand. There you see, Bunny Hopper blinks first. He says, all right, these aren't coming down as 7-7s seven anytime soon, and I need pressure right now. So just plays out Hooked Reaver number one as a 4-4. I wonder what kind of world we end up in if uh, Bunny Hopper had tapped to fill his hand on that turn we were talking about, burned a card, kept tapping. Might be down at 15 by now, might be playing 7-7s. Seven Would it have made a difference? I think with the way his hand was working out, he probably couldn't have had that much mana to spare. Obviously, usually only wanting to tap on odd turns rather than even sure. turns, at least after turn four. Viper just doing what he can to draw a couple of extra cards because he only really needs yeah. something like that to put himself in a very nice position to just start playing this Shudderwalk because he's now got, what, two Saranite Chain Gangs, a Grumble, a Shudderwalk. No Life Drinker. No Life Drinker yet, so it wouldn't be actually actively killing his opponent quite yet, but just freezing stuff every turn right. is pretty I damn wonder. good. It's also the other consideration in this matchup that we haven't really like glossed on. We've we've talked about just about every other aspect of the Hooked Reaver dynamic, but of course, Viper and Bunny Hopper's build of Shadowwalk Shaman also includes that copy of Black Knight. So mm. coming out as a 7-7 with Taunt actually gives that vulnerability, that activation so to the Black Knight, which then again goes into that Shadowwalk pool. And even then, if you get further Taunt minions down later in the game with some Fury Protector or whatever else, you start getting yourself in a real mess. <laughs> This curse has become our greatest strength. Body Hopper leaving himself with an incredibly difficult decision here about how he envisages the game going, about how desperate of a situation he's in. Does he think he has the ability to lock down the board by killing off Manatide Totem, or does he just need to pray? His opponent doesn't have any healing so that he can close out the game with Gul'dan in a couple of turns, and with Viper picking up the healing rain and with a Volcano ready to go. It's looking to me like it might just be too much healing for Bonnie Hopper to be able to take this back. Yeah, the next couple of turns, I think, are still a little bit awkward for Viper to plot out here because if he doesn't answer the board state here and just heals, Bunny Hopper pushes 10. Yeah. And then from there, Viper's going, what, Chain Gang Grumble with, and then has zero protection on board again? I guess he can drop the Ancestral Healing after that, but still, Spellbreaker or Black Knight from Bunny Hopper is then very spooky. I think I'm feeling Volcano Saranite this turn. Okay. You just give up your Mana Tide Totem. You don't really need it at this point. The following turn, you can still then go Grumble, double Saranite Chain Gang if it survives, and it very likely will survive, because if your opponent spends four mana to go for a, hell, a Hellfire at that point, then what else are they developing beside it? It can only be four mana or less, which is very, very weak compared to a potential Lich King or something else a lot more impressive. I think you found it, Mr. Brown. That sounds like a juice to me, and Viper agrees. earlier about exactly this dynamic, the threat of Saranite Chain Gang sticking to the board and the Warlock trying to do everything that they can to prevent them from going off. But everything that Bunny Hopper can do is zero right now. 
Yeah, looking at the possibility of setting up defiles, I'm not really seeing in any capacity. Nope. I definitely imagine Tap coming down on this turn, so maybe with the pickup of a Hellfire, he could swing things back on his favor, and that's not bad, killing off one of them just to mitigate the power of Viper's next turn, but can Bunny Hopper even afford to go for that? If there is a Grumble and a Shudderwalk in his opponent's hand, does he just envisage that he loses every time anyway? So he needs to make a slightly more optimistic play, developing his own board as aggressively as possible instead of clearing off just a lonely chain gang. That's a good question. It's a four card hand that Bunny Hopper's looking over at. And we've correct, uh, kept track of this rightly. He's still missing the Life Drinker as yes. well as Viper, right? So that, it demands a very specific four card hand for Viper to be able to actually go off very soon and end the game. Yeah. Man. As I said, for Viper, even just being able to freeze the board every single turn or freeze pretty much every minion that his opponent could throw down feels like it should be just about good enough to make. Yeah, and with no uh, Hagatha activation either, he has the potential for boards of six sixes to stick to the board as opposed to those six threes that you get if you have played the Hagatha, which that's night and day yeah. against Warlock. Absolutely. Again, going to be counting up how many minions he gets back off the Blood Reaver Gul'dan. I believe it's just one homunculus, which he played so right at the start, and then a hooked Reaver as well, which is not bad considering how dire it can be when you play Blood Reaver Gul'dan with this deck. Yeah. It's not the powerhouse that you can see in uh, A8's Q block, for example. And he's just thinking here, it's fine, but it's not game winning. I need to find something more impressive. It needs to be. Lich King off the top into Army of the Dead. Something like that to make an unbeatable board state for his opponent because he has now seen two copies of Volcano thrown down. If Bunny Hopper right. could exploit a small window of weakness from his opponent, maybe he can pull this back. But with Viper, a grumble still on the board. There is no scenario in which his Shudderwalk fails now. Bunny Hopper does his best, generates the uh, most powerful looking board that he can. And if Viper's already plotting these attacks, looks like he might think it's time. He does. And there it is, the Grumble did in fact activate in the wrong order. But if this is the wrong order, I think yes. you're pretty happy. Right, no, there is, as you said, there is no failure rate. Yep. Actually, in that, that way round, he can just grumble at the end and get the maximum amount of Shudder Walks back into his hand for the following turn anyway. So he does choose to go for it. Bunny Hopper recognizes that the game just loops infinitely from that point and does not resolve in his favor. And uh, just as quick as game one, really, and I do mean quick in the context of these two players, <laughs> it's another game in the books. That's exactly right. I think the statistic was that out of both of these players, they have been involved in four of the five longest games here at the Summer Championships, with Bunny Hopper and Viper both having very slow play styles. But as you said, as we enter the top four and these players being such good friends and practice partners already, they do both appear to be a little bit more relaxed in their play, especially Viper with 2-0 up now. Only one game from meeting A8-3-6-5-0 here in the finals. Yeah, that one game that he has left to win is with his Warlock, though, which is the potential weak point in the series. We'll see if he can pick up a win with it right after this. This week's episode of Talk Still. Now it's time for the well played moment where we talk about our favorite plays. Uh, our well played moment has to be from HT Soul just a few weeks back. Taunt Druid versus 
Shutter Walk Shaman. Cyndalol goes with a 2-4 Acolyte of Pain that he had just drawn thanks to Prince Keliseth earlier on. Saiyan recognizes this, and he's like, well, I'm not really aggroing him down. He's drawn so many cards. I just gotta go for it here. And so he swipes, and he naturalizes, and he puts more damage in the Acolyte. And everything seems to be going well. You know, the pieces are getting burned. And I'm like, it was burned. I'm like, these are important cards. Burned. These are very important cards. But so I was like, everything still works. And then all of a sudden, hmm, well played. Boom! Shutterwalk just blows up. And Sintolaw, you can see it in his face. It's like like rage and fury. Like Sintolaw, he's like, I'm done. I can't win. It's over. Just concedes. And it's it's like it's just insane to watch. Kind of the perfect way to cap off that intense series with Sintolaw burning the Shutterwalk. Game five. Oh. Yeah. With the developers. Uh, my battle cry upon coming into the room, uh, it's hard to say what its effect would be in game, but I'm sure it would probably ensue in some kind of 80s uh, musical stinger. Uh, I think it'd just be like an exasperated sigh. Honestly, it'd probably be a laugh because I just laugh all the time in any situation and sometimes inappropriately. <laughs> I'm very tired in the mornings and I always have meetings in the mornings, so I just kind of like sit down like. <sighs> I'm pretty sure I would not have a battle cry, and I would have stealth, because that is what I do all day on accident, is accidentally startle people that I just wanted to talk to. Oh man, if I had my own battle cry, it would probably bring uh, bring bring joy and a smile, put a smile on everyone's face. You just open the door and like, dun 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 dun, trumpets are thundering, it's like, who? oh it's Josh again. Oh. If I were going to try and not startle people, then my battle cry would probably be, hey, can I talk to you real quick? I don't know if I'd have a voiceover. It, it, it'd be more of an aura where like, you just enter the room and, and everyone just starts like laughing. If I had a battle cry whenever I walked into the room, it would be to uh, transform the color of a random person in the room's hair. <laughs> just like that. Welcome back, guys. Viper stretched out to a 2-0 lead in this series. Only the Warlock left to win with his opponent, Bunny Hopper, his friend, his countryman, his practice partner, and the man who brought the same 120 cards, the same 430 card decks to this tournament. They are playing what should have been, perhaps, a literal mirror match, only mixed up by the fact that different decks were banned out. And now you start to see the differences Bunny gets to roll out with his big spell mage, whereas it was the mage that was banned away from Viper, leaving him now with just this even Warlock to win with. That's exactly right. And while obviously Viper is left with a mirror match at the very worst uh, in a, or actually argue, arguably the very best from Bunny Hopper with his own even Warlock there, Bunny Hopper's two remaining decks in the Miracle Rogue and the Control Mage outside of that, I think are pretty decidedly not great matchups for the even Warlock. As for this one, with the Control Mage, generally your threats we just don't line up well enough against their removal. Your things just die before you can kill them. And then in the late game, while traditionally Blood Reaper cooldown has been a very strong death knight against Frostlit Jaina, I think with the amount of tapping you're doing and how few demons you get back, the Water Elementals pretty quickly overwhelm you. And you see it again, no ping, turn two from Bunny Hopper. No reason to deal damage. It's very similar to the Shadowwalk Shaman dynamic we described earlier, but now reversed. It's Bunny Hopper that has no merit in his deck to deal damage. And that's not because he has some kind of infinite, unstoppable win condition at the end of the game. <laughs> it's just because he has enough removal to blow up every single thing that Viper plays this game. I mean, his infinite unstoppable win condition is Viper just running out of cards mm. in his deck. I guess, yeah, fatigue is the ultimate unstoppable win condition, actually, when you think about it, right? That was really almost really deep. Mm. But it wasn't, so let's move on. Oh. Got it. But for Viper in this instance, he has to be feeling pretty good with Giant into Drake, turns three and four, pretty much the perfect curve of nice threatening minions. But Bunny Hopper, as we mentioned, has found the removal he needs. It just stacks up so well for the Control Mage. And as always seems to happen with the Even Warlock, you just kind of run out of stuff in the middle turns of the game until you ramp up to Blood Reaver Gul'dan, Lich King, maybe even a Dread Infernal. 
your yeah. turns in the middle are just pretty mediocre. Yeah, I think that Dread Inferno actually ends up being one of the key minions because not only is it one of the biggest threats in your deck outside of the Mountain Giants in terms of pressure, what it's also a minion that can come back from do? the Blood Reaper Gul'dan actually like Good point. full power four, right? You, you get to the position where maybe you forced out a couple of Blizzards and a Dragon's Fury and a Flame Strike from your opponent clearing the board, yeah. and then uh, you get back to that Gul'dan position and they, they have to do something just a little bit desperate, maybe, in that one moment to clear your what board. And if your board is what just four do? fours and two fours, it's much easier for them to clear that board than six health. Exactly. Or not even needing to clear the board in later stages of the game. If you don't keep up the pressure on the mage, they will very happily throw down a Dragon Call or Alana and represent reverse lethal in surprisingly quick fashion. Right. What to do? Bunny Hopper now just considering the options of whether this Twilight Drake warrants a Polymorph. Because as I said, hitting that Polymorph on the Dread Inferno is a very, very big deal because yeah. it basically creates the exact opposite scenario from what I just described. And yeah, there's just a, just a pair of sheep chilling on the board right now. To a turn. Clock them. <laughs> this is not like the Shadowbox Shaman no. that we cast earlier. Right. Yeah. Two sheep on the board will not make all the difference in the world here. That's very true. If both players just do nothing from now until the end of the game, it's, it's Viper that's wrong this time. <laughs> <laughs> Definitively, I will agree with you. But still, for the moment, it's not bad just to get in that little bit of early damage because when we do enter the super late stages of the game, obviously a very fair way off yet. Every point of damage will matter a great deal. Viper will be trying to close out the game with damage from Blood Reaver Gul'dan, damage from Hellfire, or just trying to stick that one last minion to close things out. I was going to say, Derek is currently going through hazing right now by TJ. Off to his left, TJ is doing everything he could to make Derek laugh for the last 30 seconds. And Derek, like the trooper that he was, held on for a very long time. But finally, it went down. You don't want TJ as your boss. You know, Derek's here. It's your know, first HCT championship. He's trying to make a good impression. And TJ's just over there trying to ruin his day. Am I allowed to say what he's doing? Will I get in trouble from TJ, my I boss, if I do? TJ said way worse <laughs> things than any of us on stream this week, so don't worry about it. Oh, I was so close to not laughing, but it's just impossible to not laugh at TJ. At being the operative word. Time runs out on me. Meanwhile, there's been a game of Hearthstone going on. Absolutely. Spellbender, as so often seems to be the case. The pick here, I believe, for Bunny Hopper. Not really all that many targeting spells at all. In fact, I think it's literally just Spellstone in the even Warlock deck that's leading Bunny Hopper to go for this. But even if that does end up being a very, very late game card that actually he ends up reaping the rewards from, if he can pull away a Spellstone from a Water Elemental from the Lich King, something like that can be exactly the delay he needs on Viper to pull things back. You all right? Yeah, I was just thinking about TJ again. <laughs> it's, it's delayed action. He's still getting me. Yeah, Spellbender is always kind of a viable secret to, to pick off um, Arcane Keysmith. I forget who was the first said this to me. I'll just role play as Admirable and just say it was Firebat or Chucky, <laughs> or Chucky one of the two. Yeah. Um, first said to me that like Arcane Smith, Keysmith, you don't necessarily have to take the most appropriate secret. Just take like the most annoying secret for your opponent to test, which yeah. is quite often Spellbender. Because then they have to go through this rigmarole of like checking all of the right. secrets one by one and doing inefficient things to get it all out of the way. That's right, because all the other ones, you kind of test them together. Like, obviously, Frozen Clone, Mirror Entity, and Explosive Runes all tested together. Vaporize and Ice Barrier, you test in the same fashion. And here, Viper has got it narrowed down to, I think, exactly Spellbender in one turn, actually, with a spell played, a minion played, and a minion attacked face. I right. think now that Ice Block has gone out, that's all you need to do to test everything other than Spellbender. Very true. Good job. And again, Bunny Hopper still never attacking the face, afraid of those hooked Reavers. But at the same time, Viper is starting to get down to that crucial threshold where they will be playable once again. And even outside of that, the cards on the right side of his hand, Giant and Lich King, the 8-8 boys coming in to try and close out the game in one immediate fell swoop. Yeah, and you can see both players 
still very involved in this game. They're not playing at any kind of rapid pace, They're still considering their options, and you know, still treating this game with a bit more respect than perhaps TJ is over there, because there's still a lot of stake, even though they came with the first goal, and I think every player when we interviewed them said their initial goal was just get to the World Championship. Yeah. Even with that achieved, there's still so much on the line here. Just winning this series is a $15,000 boost in prize pool, which is crazy in itself. There's still $50,000 additional on top of that that they can play, uh, play for at the championships as well. Not to mention the huge boost in HCT points that they get as they move up those rankings. Who for Bunny Hopper in particular, are massively important because he's in that top 10, yep. trying to keep pace with F2K, who had an incredible ladder season. And even outside of the points and the money, just in terms of recognition, when you think of last year's Hearthstone Championship Tour, obviously Tom60229 is the first name that comes to mind, but just Stanudachi Hoi Surrender. They're just three names that obviously pop out. Right. It's such a big stamp to put in your book. It will always be associated with winning a championship. You, people won't have to try and remember you as the, the second or third, fourth place, as only do. nerds truly remember. It's first place or nothing. Yeah, and how many times even during these broadcasts do you see the, the, the VT rolled of the seasonal champions yeah. raising the trophy? You know, your name goes into the record books and to the annals of time as far as Hearthstone history goes. That's what these players are playing for. One thing I will say, though, is that the... Uh, the region debate is definitely not here anymore, at least for this <laughs> event, because actually this is Europe versus Europe. So there will be one more win picked up for Europe by the end of this series, regardless. That'll put Europe at a total of 13 wins, which is as many as the other three regions combined at this point. Does anyone still want to have this debate? No takers, that's what I thought. Job done. <laughs> as I'm sure chat explodes in a flurry of eat you greater than NA. Yeah, enjoy that, Whoa. mods. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> but now for Viper, as you mentioned, that Dread Infernal, just one more threat. He has actually managed to find pretty much every threat on the top half of his deck. I believe both Giants, both Drakes, Lich King, Dread Infernal, all found at this instance. It's only really uh, Blood Reaver Gul'dan he needs to find, and it's not even turn 10, and he's only got 10 cards left in his deck. I think at some point here, Bunny Hopper has to start developing some threats of his own, especially since they are protected behind that spellbender that he still has in play, because he can't just keep going one for one with removal spells at this point. This is its one of the ways that big spell mage can be exploited, is that if you force them to keep going one for one with removal spells, or even one for two with their removal spells, because they don't draw cards, really, they do run out before you run out of threats quite a lot of the time. That's yeah. why getting value out of cards like Stonehill Defender, additional taunts, Baron Geddon's, Lich Kings, those kind of auxiliary options to contest your opponent's board is so vital. And I love here Bunny Hopper just using the slowest card in his deck, really, while he still has 20 health available. Not to mention it's just an 8-8 protected behind that, that spell bet. Exactly, and not only that, just the fact that with six damage on the board from his opponents, this is probably the smallest amount of damage he's going to see on board for a pretty long while, because yep. even though I've been mentioning the big threats have all been found for Viper, in an even deck like even Warlock, throwing down two four drops on the same turn is perfectly fine in the late game. Once you realize Spellbreaker is not going to get the value it wants to hit, or Shroomboy isn't going to get the value it wants to hit, you play them both on the same turn, eight attack, and just demand another answer from your opponent. A decent defile here if he wants to take care of the 8 8. It looks like Viper's just going to go ahead and develop into this and just go face. Yeah. Just leave the 8 damage in play. I think I like this a lot. This has a double benefit of making a board that's very awkward actually for the mage to find a single re uh, removal answer to. It has to be most likely Blizzard into another removal card, which is a lot of answers that you're demanding from your opponent. And the other benefit is you're getting damage to the face while also having your demons die before you what play the Blood do? Reaver Gul'dan, which will then in turn demand another answer. And while you may be running out of threats, every single removal card you bait out from your opponent likely ends up in one less water elemental being made after Frostlich Jaina comes down. Does it mean Bunny now has to... Oh, oh my oh, god, oh. infinite Sintragosa loop. Those are two... Pretty good legendaries, wow. 
That's a face collector alongside it, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I thought throughout this game that Viper was the face collector. Haha. <laughs> I don't... I, was that a joke? What does that even mean? I'll let you decide <laughs> okay. that one. Join the conversation. Hashtag HCT Summer. Hashtag what did that even mean? <laughs> let me know. I'm personally a fan of the slightly more derisive, what did that even begin to mean? But Blood Reaver Gul'dan now with all the all the demons being dead, being resurrected here. It's looking pretty good to me. Jaina is picked up though. I've cast a lot of games of Hearthstone in my time, which means about Three months ago, I ran out of interesting ways to say, well, that's a good draw when someone picks up Frostlich Jaina. What to do? Yep. What to do? It is just one of those decks that, I don't know, similar to, what was it back in the day, like Justicar Warrior just relies entirely on one minion for its big threats to close out the game. Yeah, sometimes you can get the job done with Alana, but quite often, once you've uh, exhausted your I almost entirely reactive deck, it does rely so hard on that Jaina to be able to claw itself back out. Here's a bunny hopper. I think realizing there is no fail state here. Both polymorphs have been used. He already thrown down a Dragon's Fury. He always clears off the entire board there, which feels pretty fantastic to me. Manages to hold back Blizzard and Meteor, as I mentioned, to try and make Frostlit's Jaina a little bit more juicy on a later turn. Viper now starting to wonder, what is my game plan in this scenario? Oh, yeah. Am I more likely to win through locking down the board, managing to stick a minion and thus hero powering the ooze on this turn? Or am I more likely to win through just hoping my opponent doesn't have any removal or any healing, sorry, and hero powering the face every turn? He's got two hellfires in hand, so he only needs to get his opponent down to nine. It's very true. It's not the most absurd suggestion. 14 cards still left in deck for Bunny Hopper as well. Definitely something to consider. And it's not like by pinging face he has to completely ignore board control for the rest of the game. He could still go for Gen Grey main hero power face on this turn, or even this is a, a middle of the road option. He has now set up lethal. If he'd have found a more aggressive uh, Lich King card as well, he could have potentially found situations where he'd set up lethal through Frostlich Jaina, but unfortunately unable to do that now, which means he has to start answering these water elementals. And again, that Spellbender has right. just not been dealt with since the beginning of the game. And I was imagining a scenario exactly like this when Bunny Hopper picked it, and I'm sure he would have been as well, where he's I thinking, I just want to be able to deal with a water elemental, uh, or he wants to be able to protect a water elemental when it comes down, because although the first one can often be dealt with through, I don't know, a Lich King card, something like that, they just snowball so quickly if left on the board. You unbelievably quickly pull yourself out of range of any kind of death. Yeah. So many bloody decisions. There is a route you can take against Frostlich Jaina, uh, which is a little bit awkward in spots where you just kind of wipe the board on both sides and just refuse to play minions. And just, you know, if they are going to make water elementals, you make them do it themselves. Uh, but I don't think Viper's seen you know, all of the voodoo dolls come out from Bunny Hopper. He has seen both polymorphs, which is one of the best ways to do it. But the big kind of breaking point here will be that Sindragosa that Bunny Hopper has that can continue to generate water elementals for him. Well, no, the big breaking point here is he needs healing right now, and it's only Baron Geddon that gives him any possibility of gaining life on this turn. He has to realize with this line of play, Viper knew he was getting into a spell breaker, so he clearly was very committed to clearing off that elemental and getting the damage through to face. So another uh, Hellfire being in hand is a very likely scenario for which Bunny Hopper has to prepare. Geddon is there, though. 
don't think we've seen artificers yet either. So this is this is very much a gambit from Viper to kind of go all in on the damage route here. But you know, is there any other win condition that he could exactly. possibly have found? I think it's a very very nice spot from him. Because even if, uh, obviously, Artificer is the best case scenario for Bunny Hopper. But he sees it. He realizes that his opponent is making a big push for lethal here. And simply throws away the Baron Geddon for as much healing as possible, even with the Doomsayer as well. Yep. Just drops the Doomsayer to pick up that extra two points of healing. Any minion that Baron Geddon would damage there is two extra points of lifesteal to heal up Frostlitz Jaina in that spot. So now Viper is all the way back to square one in terms of trying to set up a win condition for himself. Now, where are we? Does he just start pinging face and hope he gets there? Bunny Hopper doesn't draw Voodoo Doll, which is just about the only way he has to generate water elementals himself from Viper's position. Exactly. Because this is a yep. random Syndragosa in hand. That's a Syndragosa from an initial frozen champion from a Syndragosa. So Viper could be wanted to just start pinging away, try and get there that way. That way he dies to two things. He dies to Voodoo Doll yep. being turned into a water elemental, and he dies to just bang Alana on the board. And so if he is going to go with the minion development route, he has to go all in on it. He can't just play one minion at a turn, because as you said, he then just dies straight up to a Voodoo Doll. He has to commit both like Gen or Black Knight on this turn in combination with Volga Homunculus. Or Spellbreaker plus Shroomer, I guess. Just the Shroomer. Oh, boy. I think with this line of play from Viper, he maybe should have committed a little bit more to his original thinking of closing out the game with hero power as quick as he possibly can. Eventually, as you mentioned, Bunny Hopper will find either Alana, Voodoo Doll, or the Arcane Artificer. And now Bunny Hopper has mm. two out of those three options decide. available to him. Yep. Yeah, the Artificer is a weird one because you can actually play around that a little bit by not playing minions yourself, right? Like like Meteor becomes hard to use if you don't play targets. But most of the time, he's going to be able to just Artificer and just AoE and Empty Ward if yeah. he really needs to. But he was still so many turns away because of that big Baron Geddon heal. And I think actually that Doomsayer being dropped from Bunny Hopper actually altered the clock by an entire turn, potentially, Massively. which might have uh, pushed Viper off that just straight up burst damage now. with the hero power. And I am, I've got to be honest, pretty amazed at how close Viper managed to make this series. Even though he drew all of his threats, Bunny Hopper was looking so dominant for the entire game. Viper coming incredibly close with his very nice play around Spellbender. Even though Bunny Hopper set that up on turn four or five of the game, yeah. still only one dead draw from Bunny Hopper away from winning through the hero power. My hunger grows. Obviously realizing in this scenario, if he is ever to win this game, that's that single copy of Arcane Artificer has to die on this turn, or at the very least be silent to negate the effect. So many bloody decisions. It's getting to that point though, where we are fast approaching 0%. I must feed now. As soon as Viper sees that Bunny Hopper got any kind of a respectable minion off of either the Syndragosa Frozen Champion or the Face so Collector many itself. Bloody decisions. Still committing to the minion development line. Significant amount of pressure, though, is it? Bunny Hopper is just free to do just about anything he wants here. The stubborn gastropod is an irritant at best, but I don't think this board state would necessarily deter him from a uh, from an Alana play if he had it in hand, for example. Ooh, there's another Lich King is represented here, but I'm thinking from Bunny Hopper. He might just take a Saranite Chain Gang or something a little bit cheaper. His hand is incredible. Incredibly expensive outside of that. But I do love from him here, above all else, prioritizing making a water elemental because he realizes the one thing he could potentially be vulnerable to 
is just those hero powers to face every single time. He does not need to go all in on making a Lich King or a Syndra Gosa here. As long as he's defending himself with the uh, Stonehill Defender and putting up a decent threat at the same time, there aren't really any single massive minions he needs to be afraid of to kill with the Voodoo Doll. He's seen the Lich King, he's seen both Twilight Drakes, both Mountain Giants, even a Dread Infernal. Pretty much every big minion has been dealt with. Yeah, we set it up right from the beginning. Bunny Hopper doesn't have to set up an aggressive win condition for himself. He just, he just doesn't have to. He just does not have to commit a Lich King to the board. He never has to try and connect to face with an 8 8. None of that madness. He's just right close to the line. Just clearing every minion in, in Viper's deck. And now Viper yet again just faced with the dilemma. The water elementals are going to start to snowball very soon. He's out spellstones. He's out hellfires. And Defile in hand is only going to do so much. Even Black Knight trade ping is not good enough to take care of the board state. He's just got to keep going face. He obviously realizes at this point, uh, Spellbreaker obviously does not remove the lifesteal effect from Water Elementals because it is an aura effect generated by Frost Lich Jaina. Right. Uh, just as a slight technical detail that Viper and Bunny Hopper will obviously both be aware of as they are very proficient control mage players indeed. Flame Strike ping, two Water Ellies on board. And I love as well from Bonnie Hopper how liberal he's being with his removal pieces here. I think this is exactly spot on in this scenario because as I pointed out a, a second ago, obviously it's kind of the effect that he is not afraid of any singular big minion, but he can just dominate the board with water elementals. They will act as his removal spells just by clearing everything off every turn. Yep. And as soon as he's not having to spend mana on a removal spell, he can just throw the Lich King. But Viper realizes that's enough, throws it down, and Bunny Hopper finally puts a win on the table again. I think the only deck that has lost so far this series has been even Warlock. You might be right, yeah. And I, I was about to say, we're going to find out exactly how strong Viper's resolve is, because that has looked like a concedable game for several turns now, but Viper was just holding on to that fraction of a chance that sticking one minion and getting some hero powers to face might have just got the job done. But I think when that second water elemental appeared on the, uh, on the board, it was just writing on the wall. It was indeed. Still, I would like to say from Viper, I think pretty spot on with the even Warlock as well. I think he realized what his one opportunity was there, which was just to go super aggressive with the hero powers in that one small window when maybe his opponent didn't have any healing. Uh, good knowledge of what the mage's weakness is, even after Frostlich Jaina has come down. But still, as we saw from Brunny Hopper, a little bit too much healing, very strong control mage play. And still, even Warlock for both sides suffering here once again. Yeah, well... Bunny Hopper has begun his comeback, and even Warlock is still looking a little bit fragile. Find out if he can pick up that much needed win for Viper right after this. on this week's episode of Talk Still. Now it's time for the well-played moment, where we talk about our favorite plays. Uh, our well-played moment has to be from HT Soul just a few weeks back. Taunt Druid versus Shadowwalk Shaman. Sindelal goes with a 2-4 Acolyte opinion he just drawn thanks to Prince Keliseth earlier on. Saiyan recognizes this, and he's like, well, I'm not really aggroing him down. He's drawn so many cards. I just got to go for it here. And so he swipes, and he naturalizes, and he puts more damage in the Acolyte. And everything seems to be going well. You know, the pieces are getting burned. And like, it was burned. I'm like, these Hex are important cards. Burned. These are very important cards. But it's obviously everything still works. And then all of a sudden, hmm, well played. Boom, Shutterwalk just blows up. And Sintulaw, you can see it in his face. It's like like rage and fury. Like Sintulaw, he's like, I'm done. I can't win. It's over. Just concedes. And it's it's like it's just insane to watch. Kind of the perfect way to cap off that intense series with Sintulaw burying the Shutterwalk. Game five. Oh. Yeah. With the casters! If I were to create a dream team with myself uh, and on two other players, I'd pick Brian Kibler 
uh, and Shiro, his dog. I think us three would be an unstoppable force. Well, I actually do uh, you know, a bunch of content via Omni Slash with Firebat and Zelay. They're both super smart players, you know, super dedicated, really good. Uh, and I think that they uh, you know, would work well together uh, alongside me because we've worked together before. I guess uh, I'll put Shiro as my number one draft pick. And then, uh, you know, Kimber can still come in, but he just knows that he wasn't my number one choice now. Oh, who would I pick as my two teammates? Goodness, you put me on the spot here. Well, I gotta pick TJ, because TJ's like, know, he's like my brother. Uh, that's Admirable is one of them. Longtime casting buddy of mine. And we, I, I think we can game with the best of them. If they think they can't beat us, I challenge them to see if they can hit Ragnarok shots better than us. And we have so much built up synergy, and we'd be able to uh, find the best decks pretty quickly, or at least find the weirdest decks that would lose in a blazing glory. I challenged them because they could not. We are the best at that. Uh, I know because one time TJ and I won 11 coin flips in a row. And Frodan would be my second one, uh, just because uh, he's always got everybody else's backs. Personally, I used to have Raven on my team, but I've got a new and improved partner alongside me now, Derek. Oh. I'm, I'm just kidding. I never had Raven on my team. <laughs> Wow, I'm not sure who that was more savage to. Oh, just everyone. That's that's my general approach. Just <laughs> scatter gun savagery, oh, so whoever's <laughs> unlucky <laughs> enough to get in the way. Scatter raven gun savagery, <laughs> yeah, everyone. Exactly. As now Bunny Hopper able to get a flip of the first match we saw in this series, Miracle Rogue up against that even Warlock, which looked pretty decidedly in Viper's favor all the while throughout, and for Bunny Hopper, he has got one of the best hands against even Warlock I think you can have. It looks pretty spectacular to me, and I think Bunny Hopper shows he's still fully invested in this series. As we said before the break, there's still a ton on the line here, $15,000 yep. just for the, the first increment of winning this series and progressing to the finals, and a further uh, prize pool boost to play for after that, not to mention the HCT points, and as you were pointing out, the prestige and the infamy that comes with being a seasonal champion, because if he just wanted to get this over with, he probably wouldn't be queuing both of his favorable matchups right. first. He would just be jamming the even Warlock mirror, which is the one that he really needs to win, yeah. and then we he'll just see what happens. If he wins that matchup, then he can right. proceed through the two favorables, but Bunny Hopper wants to get his teeth into this series. He's taking it very seriously, as evidenced by the fact that he's just going through his favorable matchups first. That's exactly right. As we mentioned multiple times so far here over the last few days, not all wins are created equal. This should be, according to the numbers, a pretty easy win for Bunny Hopper, especially when he's got Hench Clan Thug into Coin Valspine Slayer. But again, there we're seeing this kind of signature style of play from Viper and Bunny Hopper, which must have been very uh, heavily practiced by them of just playing out their minions with the even Warlock. They're not tapping nearly as aggressively as we've seen from the majority of the other players. Yeah, you can see the similarities, uh, not just in the even Warlock, but in other decks as well. But yes, particularly, this is a very identifiable style that these two players who practice together, good friends with each other, and have brought exactly the same deck lists. This uh, potential to just play out smaller minions, and it's not just been in this matchup been several matchups where we've seen them just play out two drops, coin two drops right. and turn one just to be able to get on the board. Haven't seen anything like it from the other players. Now for Bunny Hopper, arguably messing with the curve of his hand pretty drastically by going for coin Edwin, but obviously the upsides are evident very quickly indeed. Yeah, 4-4 four, four to challenge the 2-4. Straight away, coining out a Hench Clan Thug would have mean he'd have to have daggered to then challenge this 2 4 on the following turn, which then messes up his curve because he couldn't play another three mana minion alongside this. This way, he gets to go Edwin Van Cleef into a further minion, but any minion that he does play yeah. here, what's the problem, Derek? That's what I'm looking at as well. Hellfire is a very nice, easy option for Viper to just blow up everything Bunny Hopper was trying to go for. And, you know, nothing new has changed to give Bunny Hopper the information that he's now vulnerable to Hellfire. He will have made this play of Edwin, or at least he should have done, knowing full well that he would end up very mm. vulnerable to that exact play. Now, as we see him hesitate a little bit longer, he's starting to wonder, does giving myself a nice value trade against this vulgar homunculus end up that beneficial when there are so many 
There's such a high chance that the Warlock will just completely decimate my board. Well, this is two of the biggest threats in the deck that are going to go down here to a single Hellfire. Viper, no consideration. Quickest turn he's played all week. <laughs> Snaps the Hellfire. Absolutely. Those are two minions you absolutely have to kill off right away. And, I mean, it's Miracle Rogue. Any minion left on the board is always a big threat because they can just hit it up with a Cold Blood and push forward huge amounts of damage through to the face. 2-2 two, two questing, question mark? I think you're pretty happy with a 3-3 three, three questing on this turn. I mean, outside of that, it's Dagger, Tempo Elven Minstrel for no card draw. That all feels kind of bad to me. So I think for Bunny Hopper here, you've just seen a Hellfire. Outside of that, the actual answers they have to this questing adventure are Spellstone, which I think you're pretty happy with, mm -hmm. uh, Spellbreaker, which you're also fairly happy with in this scenario because they've spent their whole turn only giving your minion minus one, minus one right. in terms of immediate effect. Yeah, the reason I consider just popping it as a 2-2 two -two is I'm wondering whether both of your Firefly, your Firefly and your Flame Elemental are both uh, needed as combo activators with this hand, like double Elven Minstrel Vile Spine. You need a lot of combo activators to chew through this. Um, but yeah, with Cold Blood in there as well, it's very possible that he can use that to kick something off as well in an emergency. Exactly. I think with the 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 worst case scenario being Cold Blood Valspine Slayer to come down on turn six. This still feels so pretty good. And obviously, with the backup plan of maybe you draw another uh, Firefly off the Elven Minstrel, you have a good chance of just drawing a zero cost spell from your deck in the meanwhile as well. I don't think, in and of itself, buffing a questing to three plays around anything in this matchup. No, from, uh, from the position so of two. It's just more immediate damage on the board, yeah. which is extremely valuable in this matchup. Every single point can make all the difference. And it's also very strong against even Warlock to load up damage on the board to go in in one big hit, rather than doing small amounts of constant chip damage, because then you end up putting them way past the threshold of the hooked Reaver to the point where they're just dying to Leroy or eviscerates, whereas if you're just slowly chipping at them, then you can enter the scenario where they play Hooked Reaver and they're out of range of your burst mm. damage. Now is Bunny Hopper. It's the first really awkward looking turn. He had a little bit of a struggle on that turn four or going into the turn four Hellfire from Viper, yeah. whether he wanted to play around it or not. But this is the first turn where just nothing really mm. quite lines up the way you'd like it to. But then for Bunny, while he obviously has some strong plays on this turn, with the most all-in on damage right now being obviously Elemental Fan Cold Blood, just to push everything through to the face, that does potentially leave you with a very messy hand outside of that indeed. If you were to pick up a card, you can't combo with Minstrel, you're feeling very sad. Bunny's going to end up diversifying his board as best he can. Dropping a Cold Blood for two, just making sure he can add some uh, some diversity to his hand as well as his board state. Give himself more combo activators on the following turn. And with uh, Hellfire used, that's one of the easiest answer to this board state anyway. But the uh, the double buff Spellstone is going to take huge chunks out of this board state. Restabilize this board for Viper. Now Viper is uh, it's a pretty heavy swing turn for him. He's got a nice little board state going for himself now. Not super exposed to Vile Spine Slayer from the opponent. It's a nice target, don't get me wrong, but it's not, you know, a big mountain giant. He's not getting a Lich King Vile Spined. He's not, he's uh, stabilized his health total a little bit as well. So pushing three here with the Firefly isn't super scary to him. That's right. And the play here for Viper, it's, uh, well, the Drake on board is an immediate benefit of last turn going for the Twilight Drake, kind of calling his opponent's bluff, saying, okay, I will leave you with a questing on board. What are you actually going to do about it? How much damage can you push here to make me really regret not clearing it off? And from where Viper was sitting, only getting plus two, mm. plus two on it from the, on his opponent's turn, he's got to feel pretty good about. Spellbreaker still knocking about behind and a very nicely healthy statted Drake on the board. Yeah. While I do like from Bunny, taking a second to consider all his options, this still does just feel like the best play to me. It's 
one of the biggest minions he can develop onto the board, pushes forward a good amount of tempo, and still leaves him with a very strong hand to follow up with. And now this is around the point of this matchup where things start to get just a little bit awkward for the even Warlock, because at this point, you generally want to be dropping quite big, quite expensive threats to the board. Lich King coming down around this point in the yeah. game, Dread Infernal as well. But your removal doesn't line up well enough against the Rogue's minions to be able to do that securely. You generally leave them with a board state in this position, and then you drop a big clunky minion. And that just makes Valera cackle with glee, because <laughs> basically every Rogue deck in the history of everything has been built to leverage against opponents that just play one big clunky minion a turn. Uh, exampled perfectly in the difference between Miracle Rogue against Taunt Druid versus Token Druid. They play a Lich King or a Sleepy Dragon, you are over the world, whereas if they go Spreading Plague, you're left significantly sadder. And here, for Viper, he's in that exact kind of scenario. If he wants to tap here, which he kind of has to do just to find something even halfway respectable, he's taking that little bit of extra damage. He's not developing anything all too threatening onto the board whatsoever. It's basically just free turn for the Miracle Rogue now. But while this is a good situation for Bunny Hopper at the moment, as is not always the case for Miracle Rogue, what you see here is just what you get. No spiders knocking about in the deck quite yet. So Bunny needs to make do at the moment with what he's got just in hand, or at least just damage spells from the deck. He is eventually, with the way things are looking, going to lose board control. Hellfire and Defile will almost certainly be able to get a board clear on the following turn. So finding cards like Leroy feels pretty good to me indeed, to start closing out this game as quick as you possibly can. I think the Leroy is more valuable than the Faldori Strider here, because yes, one threatens to end the game quicker, but Faldori Strider can keep him in the game for longer once he gets those spiders shuffled into the deck. Is that ever relevant? Uh, it absolutely could be relevant, but I think even the benefit of Faldori Strider will come from spiders right at the top of the deck rather than evenly shuffled throughout. Okay. He really needs to start moving this game a lot quicker. I still think he's very much in the driver's seat here because he's only a prep or a vile spine away from pretty much just closing it out on the spot. But it is still far from over. As you said, if he could go Faldere Strider and then find a Gadgetan Auctioneer, that's the kind of situation where extending it a little bit further into the mid to late game will work very much in Bunny's favor. But I suppose in that scenario, both cards need a little bit of help along the way. Leroy needs Cold Blood, Avis, and Sap to go for the aggressive plan. And Faldere just needs a whole bunch of draw to actually find those spiders. Yeah, neither of those are in hand right now. There is a small chance that Bunny might just brick on a couple of draws from here and allow Viper to get control of the board. That's the small window that Viper has to cling to here. That the wave, the next wave of threats is not quite coming, but there is already just one 4-4 that can be dropped. Viper, considering Lich King straight away there, there was He was so close to yeah. just dropping Lich King into that board state. Instead, bails out into a uh, Dread Infernal Defile play. Wow, what was his thinking with the Lich King? He came so close to just making that play. I mean, he consistently, against this Miracle Rogue, has been making very risky plays, using his health total incredibly liberally, and just relying on the fact that his opponent does not have the ability to punish that. We saw the Twilight Drake on turn four, facing down a questing adventurer. Here we so almost saw the Lich King up against a couple of big minions. But I think given that he had such a strong alternative that still clears the board and develops a nice minion of his own, this does definitely feel like the slightly stronger phase. Bunny shiving and now prep fanning and he's gonna dagger up and take the six to take care of this uh, Dread Infernal. Does not want to be utilizing his second Vile Spine Slayer to take care of that. I think he recognizes that maybe this is just a little bit of a bait from Viper to try and get an important removal card out of Bunny Hopper's hand before coming down with that Lich King. But Bunny Hopper did, if anything, the exact opposite. If the removal wasn't in hand, he just cycled two cards yep. to get towards it, and he did not use any kind of uh, strong resource to take care of that Dread Infer. One of the main reasons why I'm such a fan 
uh, of Shiv over Hallucination in this deck because, like you said, it's just not really a resource gone from your hand. It's only against when you're facing down the scariest of situations that I find you don't have the mana to spare for one extra point of mana to throw down Shiv instead of Hallucination. And again, it gave him one extra draw for a spider, which would be pretty much game over on the spot for Viper. Warriors of the frozen wastes. I think Viper's just out of time, recognizes he needs to make something happen. Frostmourne, probably not what he's looking for in this spot. And now the keep on the Vile Spine is looking very nice for Bunny Hopper, and the damage can start to be forced through. And that damage all adds up quite nicely to that Leroy that was drawn earlier off the Elf Prince draw. This turn, I still think, demands a lot of thinking from Bunny Hopper because outside of the obvious play of Valdere Strider into Balspine. I'm a big fan of the obvious play this turn. I'm fascinated to hear the rest of this sentence, Derek. Hellfire to file? Okay, <laughs> sure. It's something to consider. I definitely agree this is the right play to go for because the majority of the time, your opponent simply does not have it. And even when they do, they can't develop anything all too scary at, outside of it. Beside a hook reaver, against which you have multiple draws for lethal on the spot in either Cold Blood or Eviscerate. That looked very much Voila. like a Cold Blood to me. Bunny Hopper makes the aggressive play, gets punished by the exact worst case scenario. And as you said, still had the lethal outs anyway, picked it up. Bunny Hopper is not letting go of this series. He's not letting go of the chance to be a champion. He is going to square this series up. Two games to two now. They're going all the way to game five. The two players who have played the most combined amount of time of Hearthstone throughout this tournament, they're not letting up. They're going to play until the building shuts. They are indeed, but I think they'd have a hard time kicking this audience out during this game. They are so invested to see who ends up advancing through to the finals. And what a way for it to end up here. Both players on their deck that's been the weakest for them throughout this series. And while I would argue their play has been very strong with it throughout the tournament, even Warlock for both Bunny Hopper and Viper is their final hurdle to meeting A8-3650 in the finals. Yeah, and I feel like a broken record at this point, but so many series, uh, the series that I've been most involved in watching backstage and the series that we've been casting, this seems to have just been a recurring theme. Even Locke having to scrape and scrounge and just try and find a victory wherever it could. Uh, the win rate has been okay throughout the tournament, but it seems the series that we're following around tend to be the ones where even Warlock looks a little bit underpowered against the matchup that it has to face. Well, good news for fans of even Locke winning. It's going to have to, because it's a mirror match. It's deciding who is going through to be our finalist here at HCT Summer. Viper here on the coin. Mountain Giant ready to go in hand on turn three. And while we have been lauding them for their creative play with this deck, not <laughs> relying on taps turn one and two, is there any world in which he doesn't go Giant on turn three? Not many. Um, there is one in which Bunny Hopper is able to disrupt it with a play of his own. Uh, Stubborn Gastropod or Doomsayer being the options that can do that. But it's actually Viper that picks up the Stubborn Gastropod as well, we whereas Bunny Hopper has no such disruption. Strength. But yeah, I would expect both players tapping through here because this, at least up until turn four, turn five, is a very formulaic matchup. It will be played out almost the same way every oh. single time. Oh, oh. There is that Gastropod though from the Bunny. That could be so pivotal here for Bunny, and I think he knows how good it is when he is always going to be one turn behind playing his own Mountain Giant. We saw him throw away Twilight Drake from his starting hand, I believe. One of the key threats in even Warlock against pretty much any deck. Tap on two, and then it'll be next turn. He's looking to line up that tap and that stubborn Gastropod to deny the potential turn three Giant from Viper. Obviously, some counterplay then starts to evolve for Viper with obviously Coin Hellfire or Coin Spellstone, neither of which I would argue are particularly useful cards in this matchup. 
But the important factor is that that then passes initiative back over to Bunny Hopper to play his own giant first if he were to find it, which is so crucial in this matchup. Right. Tap goes off, giant down to four. One more card joins the hand for Viper on the next turn. We'll give him the turn three giant. The, the play that was just a myth, a legend, <laughs> up until Gen Greymane entered the format is a now very distinct possibility, and it's a distinct possibility that Bunny Hop is going to look to play around yeah. with this stubborn gastropod, the recent tech addition to the Even Warlock deck, and the tech addition that both of these players, of course, we've said it a bunch of times, mirrored lineups. They both have it in there. And Viper, this is not what he wanted to see on the other side of the board here, because now there is just a window that Bunny Hopper can use to seize initiative if he picks up exactly a big threat, so exactly Mountain Giant on the following turn. It's almost like the memes write themselves, just who would win, one giant mountainous beast or one Shelly boy? As Viper, how he decides to respond to this is maybe not so obvious. I was obviously looking at a first case scenario, an instant answer to it with obviously Coin Hellfire or Spellstone still leads into a giant on the following turn. But when you take a slightly slower look at it, what can Bunny Hopper really do to deal with this 2-3 you have on board that you're not happy with? Because basically everything he can do that keeps his snail alive stops him from playing his own mountain giant right. on his turn. And now the roles are reversed, right? You were talking about how Viper ha would have to Hellfire this or Spellstone it, which both aren't fantastic cards in the matchup. Well, Bunny Hopper can now has that same dynamic where he can, if he wants, Spellstone this 2-3 and keep his Gastropod al alive for the future. But he's still not anywhere closer to finding a big threat of his own to drop. He is buying these turns of tempo, but what good is it if he doesn't have the minion to seize the board with afterwards? I think this is still the way to go, though, because it's the same situation where anything Viper can do on his following turn to deal with this snail that isn't playing exactly a mountain giant is good for Viper. He's very happy with that outcome. Or is good for Bunny Hopper, sorry. And it does still give him those extra couple of turns to find a mountain giant. We could even see tap on the following turn for Bunny Hopper as he's only at eight cards in hand. Bunny Hop, as Viper could be tempted to try and again just set up a board that's difficult for his opponent to fight back against without delaying his own development in something like Gastropod into Acidic Swampoos. Because Spellstone, once it's fully upgraded, can actually be a pretty powerful card in this matchup to deal with, well, pretty much exactly Hooked Reaver in the yeah, later stages of the game. Right. Getting a fully upgraded Spellstone in this deck in particular, though, is not trivial. It's got to line up right. quite nicely. Uh, as I said, Hellfire is not a card that you're you know, just snap casting too often. There's very few perfect board states to hit with it in the mirror match. Um, so you're down to those, you know, vulgar homunculus that you have to line up. Oof. And there we go. Mountain Giant located for Bunny Hopper. Those two extra turns of tempo that he's now bought has enabled him to seize the initiative in this matchup with a mountain giant of his own. And you see exactly why what looked like a really strange tech inclusion when it was started making the rounds maybe two, three weeks ago, the stubborn gastropod started entering decks. People were like, what on earth is that thing doing in there? But now you see the single handed power of that card in the mirror matchup. Absolutely. And the power of getting it down first after Bunny Hopper seems to win the tussle, despite the fact he was going first, which, oddly enough, uh, going against all Hearthstone rules generally means you are the last person to develop your mountain giant. Yeah, because that makes sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> because why not? Yeah. Yeah, for Bunny, getting that giant down first is going to be a fantastic way to start piling on the pressure towards his opponent. But then the question becomes once again, is that something you really want to do here? Does he want to turn the game super aggressive because he will be afraid of Hooked Reaver? Is there anything that he will consider, I don't know, that makes him more inclined to go face? 
The Black Knight in his hand is something that will definitely leave him more inclined to go face. If Hook Reaver comes down as the last line of defense for Viper, he can just instantly snipe it with that Black Knight. Now Shroombrew is a possibility. Bunny Hopper wants he can take a trade. Of course, the eight damage does put Viper to exactly 15, which is not a world that you necessarily want him to. But if he wants to trade with the Acidic Swamp Ooze, he can then Shroom Brew his giant back up to full health. Use Sun Fury to potentially protect the mm -hmm. giant on giant trade coming down. Don't taunt both minions, just taunt up the Shroom Brewer. Protects your giant from the trade directly with the other mountain giant. Also protects your mountain giant from Black Knight from the opponent as well. Black Knight's present, they can Black Knight your Shroom Brewer and make the trade happen anyway, but still much, much better for you than the alternative. Exactly. Basically, anything that leaves you ahead on board in the immediate is very important because while there is still some amount of reactivity in the even Warlock deck, what I think we've seen very consistently over the weekend is just how poor uh, Defile and Hellfire have been. Obviously against the matchups like Token Druid and Odd Paladin, it's been as good as it always will be. But getting that one health minion on the board, getting a full board clear has been Woo! incredibly difficult. But Bunny Hopper oh, says, to heck with all of that, I'm going face. I'm going to close this out right now. By the way, if the play was going to happen with the trade and the reheal on the Mountain Giant, this is much better than doing it with the Sun Fury, doing it this way around with the Homunculus. Right. Obviously, he went face, but this way, the Black Knight hits the absolute so minimum target. It's a 2-4 taunt as opposed to hitting a 4-4 taunt if you'd have done it with the Sun Fury Protector. But the face attack is just a whole different story entirely. I said Bunny Hopper with Black Knight, with Black Knight in hand probably isn't too fearful of a Hooked Reaver coming down in the near future. So you'll be able to snipe it immediately, but there is, you know, Hooked Reaver and Lich King and some Fury Protector that he will have to potentially chew through. You can only put one Black Knight in your deck, unless you've got a Shudderwalk. <laughs> That's exactly right. But from Bunny Hopper, I think the main thinking here is when you actually break down what his opponent can do to fight back in a major way, it has to be like exactly Hooked Reaver and Defile. There's not really any other combination of cards that clears off the giant and develops a nice big taunt in the meanwhile. It's not a nice big taunt, but it is a nice big minion. Wow! The disrespect. That is incredibly brave. Has Bunny Hopper, Bunny Hopper has not used a Hellfire, correct? No. Obviously, he cannot double Hellfire this turn. Yeah. But he can create scenarios where over a couple of turns, again, you know, he pushes damage, he loads up a board, and then Viper has to clear that board, heal up out, out of range of six health because he has double Hellfire in hand. That is such a greedy trade from Viper. But you know what? Part of me, just deep down, <laughs> kind of respects it. Of course you've got to respect those kind of plays. Whether or not they end up working out is an entirely different question, but it takes a certain kind of player when you are one game away from advancing through to the finals to take eight damage from a mountain giant, potentially leave yourself dead on the very next turn from Hellfire and just look like that, completely unfazed. Yep. The end is coming! This is creative as well, because now if Viper wants to keep initiative here, he can't do it's well, it's very difficult for him to do that because yeah. he can't really commit mana to dealing with the Doomsayer and heal up himself and maintain a board presence. Yeah. It's, it's gonna have to be something like Shroom Brewer to face and then just pass. Right. Because if he just like tries to play Defile here just to take care of the Zero Seven, well then your opponent still has a mountain giant, and Bunny Hopper will quite happily still have a mountain giant. The, how aggressive he's been. They've been playing a pretty extensive game of Mountain Giant Chicken for this entire mirror. It started off with who was going to get to play it first with the Stubborn Gastropod. Then they both got them in play and the game of chicken commenced to who was going to trade first. Viper took the most stubborn line imaginable, but now Bunny Hopper with this super creative Doomsayer line has put Viper in a real, real mess here. Because remember, Viper has to be so scared of that second Hellfire from hand. It was uncastable from Bunny Hopper on the previous turn. He couldn't double Hellfire. 
And this, I think, is a play we've seen a few times so far here at the Summer Champs. Um, as Viper ends up taking one more damage on his Red Infernal than I think was necessary. But basically, the upshot of it is that for Viper, he's in a situation where he's still under a very large amount of pressure. Yeah, with only a 6-1 on board, Bunny Hop is entitled to be able to deal with this quite comfortably, but the Defile is going to be necessary here to take care of it. And then how much can he develop alongside that? Not a great deal. Just dropping Skulking Geist, Black Knight, Geng Gen Greymane, I guess is the most aggressive option he can go with. So that's what it's going to end up being. He is going to continue to threaten lethal at least. And I think this is just exactly what Bunny Hopper needs to do now. He's realized his advantage doesn't necessarily lie in board control or card advantage. It's health advantage, which is generally not the best metric for who's in the lead in Hearthstone. But in this instance for Bunny Hopper, what it is going to allow him to do is make Viper just play really weird. He's not going to be able to develop the best threat he wants to every turn. He is just not allowed to play Lich King here because then all of a sudden Spellbreaker or the Black Knight and he is dead on the so spot. Possibilities. It's going to be a double taunt play or taunt and heal play. Viper, both of them are viable and theoretically keep him alive. It's going to be taunt and heal. A little bit stronger of a board state developed this way than just playing the, the uh, Vulgar Homunculus which would have pushed him back down again, right into that range where just Hellfire is threatening again. But now for Bunny Hopper, this has to be the Black Knight turn. Yeah. Not Even with the threat of Lich King in the None. in the near future, it's still just so worth it, right? Yep, absolutely. He can keep uh, tapping very aggressively to find himself a Hellfire, or sorry, a Spellbreaker at a later point. What I do find yeah. interesting is his decision to go for uh, the taunt here over the ooze. It gives him the benefit of protecting the slightly higher health minion, but it does all of a sudden leave him pretty vulnerable to a Black Knight from his opponent. If your opponent's Black Knighting you here, though, what's he doing with the rest of his mana? Mm, fair point. I'll tell you one thing he's not doing with the rest of his mana if he Black Knights you, and that's coining Gul'dan, which I think is what Bunny Hopper is trying to prevent by any means necessary. As Viper has somehow managed to find a window despite Bunny Hopper's relentless onslaught, where he is able to hear, clear, and try to seize initiative with this Doomsayer, which could be so pivotal if he can manage to stick the Lich King on an empty board. That's when things start to really turn around for him. Yeah, Doomsayer draw was really clutch from Viper because. Bunny Hop has been making these kind of plays the entire game. The stubborn gastropod enabled him to steal tempo and play Mountain so Giant first. Mid-game plays did kind of the same thing. And now here, the play where he forced his opponent to not coin Gul'dan by loading up so much power gave him the opportunity to drop Blood Reaver Gul'dan first. But Viper had the counterplay locked up with that Doomsayer draw, dropping it here. Now Bunny Hopper can still play Blood Reaver Gul'dan. It is a oh, legal yes. play. And he is still going to go ahead and do it because this still increases his clock by one turn. All he now has to do is ping that face twice. And all he's giving up to the board is one vulgar homunculus. He is indeed. And looking at Bunny Hopper's thinking here, his opponent had gained the right to play Lich King on that turn. And Bunny Hopper all of a sudden has ripped it away once again. Whilst we can obviously see no Hellfire available for Bunny Hopper. Viper is thinking, if I don't start developing a board now, I'm never going to win. I'm just going to take the risk that he has no damage at all. It's not healing from the Death Knight. Sorry, from the Lich King. Which means Viper is smack out of healing in hand. And yeah, I think Bunny Hopper was pleased, if anything, to see Lich King come down that turn. He just wanted anything but Gul'dan to hit the board that turn crows. from Viper. And now at 18, Bunny Hopper goes up to 21. Is Bunny Hopper worrying about lethal outs coming from his opponent here? It's definitely something to consider in this scenario. 10 damage on the board is pretty scary indeed. But I think here in this scenario, he knows there's pretty much no way he's dead on this turn. 
So instead, he can just hero power face, develop a taunt of his own to put something in the way. And it demands healing from his opponent. Viper has none. And that's it. Viper gives it up. The ultimate mark of respect. The light tap concession. These two great friends, practice partners, countrymen, they both achieved their goal. The respectful handshake at the end, but it is Bunny Hopper, the man whose story we have been following for a number of years now through HCT, who is going to find himself in the finals of HCT Summer. What a way to do so. While my own personal pick was Viper, I have to find myself pretty happy for Bunny Hopper here with a reverse sweep in that series, managing to pull it back. And now our only player who is left completely undefeated in the Summer Championships. Could he just go entirely undefeated through to being our champion? It'd be an incredible achievement. It would be an incredible personal achievement for Bunny Hopper. It's already an incredible achievement for Europe as a region because that's an all-European final. We have Viper as a defeated European semi-finalist also qualifying for the World Championship. And then the only thing that prevented a clean sweep was that one of Bunny Hopper and Turner had to cannibalize each other. Otherwise, we'd just be sending four Europe play European players to, champion to World Championships, Daryl. But enough bragging from me. Cora is standing by with the man of the hour, Bunny Hopper, to talk about that series. Yeah, I've got somebody here who's about to do some bragging of his own and well-deserved. It's a full European finals, and Bunny Hopper is joining A86350 in the finals. What's going through your head right now? Feels good to win, even though I had to win against Viper. After being 0-2 down, reverse sweeping the lock. We both knew that the even lock was going to be the worst stack, and it was probably going to come down to a mirror match that we had at the end. Um, yeah, still happy to win and be able to compete for the trophy now. The trophy, a good amount of money, 30 HCT points and $50,000 for first place. Of course, you know, you never like having to take out a good friend, a practice partner. And in this case, you guys had the exact same lineups, 120 cards for cards, the same lineup. How do you prepare uh, for that instance? You know, do you ever really think that you're going to run into that situation? No, not at all. I didn't prepare for this because I knew that we could only face each other in top four, looking at the groups. So, um, like I said, my main goal here was to make top four, uh, and I'm super happy I made that. And at the end, it's just, uh, it's, you can just flip a, like, you flip a coin on what deck you ban in the end because, I don't know, if he bans something, like, there's, there's a whole carousel of, if I, I ban this, you ban this, and then, well, I was hoping that we could, like, would end up with the same bans to have the like, most fair matchup possible, but obviously we can't, like, you know, tell each other what to, ba tell each other what to ban, because that's like, you know, it's not in the rules. <laughs> hey. Stick into the rules, very nice. We, we appreciate that here. <laughs> you're going to the World Championships. Viper is also going to the World Championships. So the important thing is your strategy paid off. Congratulations. You will be fighting for that Summer Championship title. But before we get into the finals, we've got a little pre-show for you as Bunny Hopper and A8 get a chance to check out each other's lineups and prepare for one of the biggest matches of their Hearthstone careers. So let's go ahead and check out the pre-show.